One of the television networks ran a series of five programs on the early days of Christianity, and they included the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, one of the most graphic pictures I have ever seen. And among all the emblems of the world, none is admired, glorified, and worshiped as the cross. It was the instrument of Christ's suffering and death, and it's also the instrument of our salvation. Every time the gospel is proclaimed, those who hear the message and receive Christ as Savior come by the way of the cross. But if you neglect or refuse God's offer of love and mercy from the cross, you help crucify Jesus Christ. That's the reason it's wrong to say that the Jews crucified Christ, as Christians said, especially in the Middle Ages, and they used to make, try to make Jews converts at the end of a sword or point a gun at their head or a knife at their throat to try to make them converted because they said they would Christ kill us. They did not kill Christ. Do you know who killed Christ? All of us. We all had a part in his death because his death was planned before the foundation of the world because of sin. And the Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. There are four dimensions of the cross that I think about when I talk about it. I think about the breadth of the cross. The love of Christ is manifested in the cross of Christ that includes everybody. God's love extends to Africa, to Asia, to Latin America, to Russia, to China, to America, to Canada, to the whole world. It includes you, whoever you are, whatever your religion, or if you have no religion, God loves you. And he says from the cross, I love you. When I studied the world's population and see how fast it's increasing and think about what it's going to be by the end of this century, only 15 years away, I'm staggered when I think of what the population is going to be. And yet God loves them all. And from the cross, Jesus Christ had the ability to think of each person as though they were the only person in the whole world. And God loves them all, and God has his messengers all over the world proclaiming the gospel. Then there's the length of the cross. It has no measure. It extends from eternity to eternity, from everlasting to everlasting. When Noah built the ark, do you know how long it was? 450 feet long. When Solomon built the temple, you know how long it was? 60 cubits. If you build a shed for garden tools, you can measure the lumber with a ruler. But how can you measure the end to end of God's love in the cross? The Bible says, Paul said that God's love surpasses knowledge. There's no way that our finite minds can even begin to understand the love of God that would give his son on the cross to die for you because you and I deserve that death. We deserve hell and judgment. And then I think of the height of the cross. It extends to the throne of God. It doesn't matter how high heaven is. Through the cross, God draws all men to him. And you have to make a decision about Jesus Christ. And then the depth of God's love and the cross. You can fall to the very bottomless pit of sin and degradation. And you can live like an animal. You can be a murderer. You can be a rapist. You can be anything, but you can't get beyond the love of God. The cross covers the, to the very gates of hell. How deep is it? There are people today that are trying to find how deep they can go into the heart of the earth and how deep space is. They can't get away from God because as we study the depths of energy, we're looking for unity that's one of the reasons they're making that study in Illinois. And the Bible says, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. 
It can draw every sinner up to the exalted height of heaven. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me, said Jesus. Think of the cross a moment and think of his suffering for you and for me. It said that Jesus endured five basic wounds that medical science defines as first, contusion, when they beat him on the head and tortured him and put a crown of thorns on him for you, laceration, they bared his back and took long leather whips with steel pellets on the end and beat him until he was bleeding from head to toe. That was the Roman way. They tortured prisoners before they took them to the cross. Then there was penetration when they crushed that crown of thorns on his brow and his head bled. There was perforation when they drove the nails through his hands and feet. There was incision when they put the spear in his side. That suffering, those nails through his hands and feet were driven by you and me and all the peoples of the world because we all had a part in the death of Christ because of our sins. Our sins put him to the cross and you participated. You may be watching by television somewhere and you would like to come to the cross tonight and find God's love and God's forgiveness and God's touch on your life. You'll see on the screen there a number. You can call it. And their counsel is standing by ready to talk with you. You might have to call several times, but keep calling. You'll get somebody. They'll be there all evening. And they'll help you and send you some literature to help you understand and to help you live the Christian life. I heard about a woman writing to a columnist and said that her cure for guilt was to go to the back garden, dig a hole in the earth, lie down on her stomach, speak all of her guilt and confess all of her wrongs into that place that she had dug and then cover it up. And people will do almost anything to get rid of their guilt. The place to get rid of guilt is at the cross. For centuries, people have done desperate things to bury their guilt. James Nelson, that we have read about last year, as a boy in an alcohol-soaked scene, beat his mother to death with a brick. He served nine years in prison, and during that time, he met Christ at the cross. And the deep repentance and confession of Christ as his Savior and his Lord. He began to study the Bible. He began to be a lay preacher. And last year he was ordained in the Church of Scotland as a Presbyterian minister. The forgiveness of God, the love of God, the power of the cross to change and forgive. How wonderful and thrilling. And today people will do anything to avoid pain and depression. And that's why alcoholism is the third worst killer in Great Britain, in the Soviet Union, and in the United States. Alcoholism. There's been a lot in the press just recently about uh, alcoholism in Great Britain and a lot in the press about it in the Soviet Union. And Mr. Gorbachev has made a speech about it because it's hindering the whole life of the people of the Soviet Union. And people will drug themselves rather than suffer from depression and loneliness. And Jesus was offered this ancient drug to subdue the pain, and he was about to be crucified, and he shook his head and said no. He must suffer the terrible agony and carry our sins on the cross in full consciousness for you. And if you had been the only person in the whole world, he would have died for you. And then in Luke 23, 34 is another thing that he said from the cross. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Now he was talking about those soldiers that were nailing him 
the crowd out there that was yelling and screaming at him. 72,000 angels pulled their swords ready to come and rescue him. And he said, no, I'm doing it because I love them. And then another thing that he did at the cross that is one of the most touching things to me in all the world. Now there stood by the cross his mother. And he looked to John, one of his disciples, and he said, John, behold this woman. And, she said, and he said to Mary, his mother, he called her woman, just like he did at Cana of Galilee, he called her twice woman. He said, woman, behold thy son. And from that hour on, John, his friend and his disciple, took care of his mother. And after that prayer meeting, after his resurrection, we never read about Mary again in the scriptures. He provided at that moment a cure for the parent-child relationship. Our mortal, our social relationships come under the Lordship of Christ. And from the cross, he was teaching us our responsibility to family, to our mothers, to our fathers, sons and daughters. There's a rock group in England called The Cure. Jesus Christ on the cross was the cure for all our human severed and ailing relationships. All the social problems, the oppressed peoples of the world feel the impact of his death on the cross. And then there was another statement from the cross. He said, it is finished. It is finished. What did he mean? In John 17, he had said, I finished the work that thou hast given me to do. God gave him a job to do, and the job was to die on the cross. To this end was I born, he said. He came to die. He's the only man ever born to die. That was why he came. We wonder why he didn't feed everybody and heal everybody. He could have done it. That would have healed some bodies and fed some people that were hungry, and he, he did that out of compassion. But his real work was the cross. And that's why the cross is so important, because there you're dealing with eternity. You see, the body is going to go to the grave, but your soul, your spirit, that part of you that lives forever, that lives inside of your body, is going to live on and on and on and on. Where is it going to spend eternity, heaven or hell? It'll be decided by the cross, what you do about the cross. Because from the cross, he's asking you to repent of sin and receive him as Lord and Savior. Yes, it is finished. And then he said something else in Luke 23. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Now, I've seen a few people die, quite a number of people die. I've heard the death rattle in their throat, but there was no death rattle in the throat of Jesus. They did not take his life from him. He laid it down voluntarily, and he said in a loud voice, notice a loud voice, he said, I commend my spirit. Into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. He gave up his spirit to God the Father. And in saying this, he conferred upon every one of us the possibility of the gift of eternal life. You can have eternal life tonight. And you that are watching by television can pick up that telephone and call that number on your screen, and someone will be there to talk to you about receiving this Christ. You know, there's a new television program entitled Invitation to Hell. Jesus' invitation is to heaven. And you remember that story last year that where we celebrated D-Day? We were in Europe at that time ourselves, and so we felt rather close to all that was going on over there. And there was a French lady called Beth. And she's now a beautiful middle-aged woman. But on D-Day, she was a child in Normandy and she was shot by the fleeing Nazis, and the bullet lodged close to her heart. 
and a Canadian soldier by the name of Al jeopardized his life and went out and grabbed her and saved her and took her to a hospital. They had not seen each other in 40 years. And when they met last year at Normandy, where President Reagan went, when Beth saw him, she had one word, tears streaming down her cheeks, and you saw the picture on television. She had one word that she said to Al. She said, Savior. That's what Jesus Christ did. We were lost, confused, without purpose and meaning in life. No assurance of a future life. And Jesus from the cross reached out by death and rescued us. And we say to him today, Lord and Savior. Are you sure he's your Lord and your Savior? Thousands of people go to church, but they're not sure that they've committed their lives to Christ. And then lastly, there was the statement that he made to a thief on the cross. The crowds down below were shouting, if you're the son of God, come down and save yourself. Others were saying he saved others himself he cannot save. They were mocking, they were jeering, they were laughing. Both of the thieves were criticizing him. You see, he was on the cross for six hours, and the first three hours they were both criticizing him and making fun of him like the crowds down below. But one of the thieves began to look. They were both guilty. They both deserved to die according to Roman law. But one of them began to look at Jesus. And he began to see something he'd never seen anywhere else before. He saw that Jesus was different, and he began to say to himself, he must be the Son of God. He must be Lord. And he rebuked the other thief, saying, don't you fear God? We deserve what we're getting, but he's not, he hasn't done anything wrong. Then he turned to Jesus, and he said, Lord, and that word Lord means my very own Lord. He said, Lord, remember me when you come to your kingdom. What an act of faith. And Jesus said, what did Jesus say? Today, you will be with me in paradise. And the angels of heaven were watching to see who would be the first one that he would take to paradise. It was a thief that deserved hell. The forgiveness and the mercy of God is so far beyond our comprehension that, it, that we, cannot, we can hardly talk about it. Yes, that thief is going to be in heaven, and you're going to see him. Jesus took him by the death of the cross. Two thieves. Which are you? Which cross are you on? the one that's rejecting or neglecting or even making fun? Or are you the one that it receives and accepts? Isn't that an interesting thing that happened there that day? 150 years ago this summer, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, probably the greatest English preacher of the last three or 400 years. He was age 16 in a snowstorm and he yearned to be saved had been to a number of churches, but no message got through to him. And finally, he turned into a little tiny Methodist chapel. And the minister didn't make it because of the snow. So a crude, uneducated farm laborer got up and just read a text and said a few mumbling words. And his text was Isaiah 45, 22. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. Look and be saved. And Charles Haddon Spurgeon looked by faith that day and received Christ into his heart. And the world is a little bit different in 1985 because Charles Haddon Spurgeon met Jesus Christ at the cross in 1850. His favorite hymn was, At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, 
and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I'm happy all the day. Has that happened to you? Do you really know Christ? Have you been to that cross? And do you, can you leave here tonight and say, I know I have eternal life. I know I'm going to heaven. I don't have a doubt about it. I'm depending on him, his finished work on the cross. You see, that thief didn't have time to get out and do any good works. The thief didn't have time to do anything. He didn't even have time to be baptized. But he's in heaven. By the grace of God and the mercy of God and the love of God through the cross. I'm asking you to make your commitment to Christ tonight. Just as simply, what do you have to do? Three things. First, you must repent of your sin. That word repent means to change. Change your way of living. Change your attitude. Now, you cannot do it alone, but God will help you if you're willing. The second thing is by faith receive Christ into your heart. By faith, you cannot come intellectually alone. Man cannot come to God just with his mind. He has to come by faith like a little child trusting his father or mother. And then thirdly, you must be willing to follow him and serve him. It's not just receiving him, it's being a follower of his every hour of the day. You won't become perfect, but you'll change directions in your life. You're going this way, and you're turned by the Spirit of God, and you start a different way. And I'm going to ask you to do something we've seen hundreds of people do here every night. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I want to know when I leave here tonight. The Bible says, he that hardened his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. You may never have a moment like this when you're so close to the kingdom of God again. Come tonight. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait. If you've come in one of these buses, they'll wait on you. If you come from that top gallery up there, it takes about a minute and a half to two minutes, so start now. And after you've all come and stood here, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you and give you some literature. You say, why do I have to come? Because every person Jesus called in the New Testament, he called publicly. Have you noticed that? Publicly. And he said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me publicly, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. There's something about coming publicly that makes it real and genuine. You may be a member of the best church in town. You may be a counselor. You may be a choir member. You may be a clergyman. But you're not sure how you stand before God. And you want to come to the cross and find forgiveness of all your sins and a certainty that if you died tonight, you'd go to heaven. You get up and come right now. Hundreds of you, just come straight down and stand here and make that commitment. We're going to wait. In a few moments, Billy Graham will be back for the personal word. But as you can see, people are responding very quickly here at the Civic Center to commit their lives to Jesus Christ. And we hope that you will do the same. Take time to write to Mr. Graham, and better yet, pick up that telephone right there and make that call. The number is on your screen, a number that you can call for spiritual help and counsel. If the line is busy, just wait a few moments and call again. Make that call now. There are many of you that have been watching by television. We're here in southern New England. Crusade being held in Hartford, in Connecticut. And every night we've seen hundreds of people come and make the commitment to Christ. And you see tonight hundreds more are coming. You can make that commitment where you are, at home. You may be in a hotel room. You may be in a bar. Wherever you are, 
pick up the phone and call the number on the screen and there'll be somebody there to talk to you. May God help you to make that commitment. And may God bless you and be sure and be in church next Sunday. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll-free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers.